שלא אחת ברך ומונאי סבנו ואותנו כתבה אדוני. Good morning, everyone. The way that I organize this class, even though it's called in the Talmud text, every text from the Talmud that every Jew should know, I uh, made sort of sub, I divided the class into sub-units so that throughout these first few weeks, we'll be looking at a theme. We've only seen one other text from the Talmud so far, but even in the midst of discussing that text, it was the famous Loba Shamayimi, the, the Torah is not in heaven, someone brought up this text from a different tractate of the Talmud, which is about the crowns and Rabbi Akiva's interpretations of the crowns on the Torah. And uh, that's because that's because the reason we're doing it this week is not because somebody mentioned it last week, but I'm not surprised that somebody mentioned it last week since this subunit contains texts from the Talmud which are all interconnected to each other, connected to each other, and, and you might say under the theme or the heading of tradition versus innovation. How much which is a central, central theme of the Talmud. How we innovate and how we uh, sustain that innovation or how we ground that innovation in rabbinic authority derived from the Torah. <laughs> you see, the challenge of rabbinic Judaism is that the oral tradition, the oral tradition means the tradition of Judaism that the rabbis present as originating on Mount Sinai, right, comes from, in, in some ways, comes from the air. The reason it is called an oral tradition is because it originates in stories. That's very hard to explain to somebody when you're trying to prove the authority of that tradition. It's much easier when there's an actual text. So th this is a theme of the Talmud. How do we prove or how do we sustain, how do we ground rabbinic authority when we don't necessarily have clear texts in order to do that. So the first text we learned, Lo Bashamayimi, I hope you see how that is a text which uh, grounds rabbinic authority in a democratic process, right? But it is just an incredible story about how the rabbis claim to have more authority than God in determining the Judaism that ought to be practiced in their time and in their day. Right? We don't, we're not going to go back to it, but those of you who were with us the past two classes, I hope we'll, we'll have learned that. Today, another text on rabbinic innovation versus tradition that every Jew ought to know. So, Rabbi, just for clarity, yeah, yeah. very baseline level of knowledge and conclusion, but are we to believe as Jews that rabbinic authority actually does equal or exceed that of God? You know, exceeds it. Exceeds it. Right. Exceeds it. We're we learned it last week. God <laughs> said, God said, remember last week, God said, Rabbi Yishmael is right. <laughs> And, well, sorry, Rabbi Eliezer is right. And uh, everybody else said, stay out of it. So it, it could be clear. It, it couldn't be clearer, right? The rabbis are saying the, the, that the Torah promises that it will stay out of the affairs of the Jewish community, of the, the affairs of Jewish law. And uh, the rabbis hold God to that promise. Right? 
I know I, I, if it makes you uncomfortable, I can't help you. That's this is rabbinic Judaism. Rabbinic Judaism is not a prophetic religion. Right? The Mormons have a prophet. If you're a Mormon, member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the president of your church is a prophet. If you're a Catholic, the head of your church is a pope who claims papal infallibility, though it's a complicated thing, right? Judaism has no such concept. We do not believe in prophets, in prophecies, or in uh, or in, in the infallibility of any one person. Of any one what person. we believe, correct. What we believe is God gave authority to rabbis, not based on prophecy, but based on their intellect to determine whether the law is right or wrong, and that is how Judaism has worked for 2,000 years. Okay. Well, I say 2,000 because that is the, the period which concluded the time of prophecy and which begins rabbinic Judaism, which is the Judaism that we follow today. So today we're going to learn another text. I appreciate everybody being here to learn. If you need a copy of the text that's in the back of the chapel, if you're not subscribed to the Beth Tikva email list, please subscribe so you can find out whether classes are, are canceled on any particular day. I hope we'll get through this text today. And as you learned last week, uh, it's a shorter text. We're not only going to learn the text itself, but we're going to watch a... That's how we're doing this. We're going to learn it, and then, for visual learners, we're going to watch a creative interpretation, a YouTube video, on the text, the depiction of the text, and then we'll talk about how it's depicted, and whether you think it's accurate, whether it, ma whether it matches what you would have thought the story to be portrayed as uh, in a creative reproduction. Okay, Menacho 29b. Your background here is uh, you need to know about Midrash. What is Midrash? Last week, over the past two weeks, the uh, core cause of the dispute was a dispute on the oven of Ahnai. And remember the question, why did they call it the oven of Ahnai? Remember that Rabbi Eliezer felt that the oven was kosher. Rab uh, the other rabbis said it was not. And they called it the oven of Ahnai from the, from the Aramaic word for snake, Ahnai. And what, remember why was it called a snake? Because they encircled it in arguments like a snake. Right? But the text itself did not explain what those arguments were and how, how uh, the process of argumentation works in Jewish law. It doesn't explain what, what Rabbi Eliezer said and what the other rabbis responded to him. The main way that rabbinic uh, arguments are engaged in is midrash. Midrash means basically interpretation. You are interpreting based on verses in the Torah, could also be verses in the Mishnah, but it's mostly verses in the Torah. There are two different kinds of Midrash. One is called Midrash Agada. Midrash Agada are interpretations of passages in the Torah, but they are passages which relate to the narrative sections of the Torah. Uh, I'll give you, you know, the famous example that I, I mentioned in, uh, in, the, in my sermon uh, two days ago of pouring the uh, wine out at the Passover Seder. I, not all of you were here on Saturday. Uh, but I was talking about how Jews cry, have to grieve for the victims, even when the victims are your enemies. Uh, 
um, because every human being is created in the image of God. And that at Passover Seder, we reenact this by this pouring out some wine from our cups when we do the ten things. This is based on a midrash. A midrash which says that God uh, was very angry at the people for celebrating uh, when the Egyptians drowned in the sea. This is a midrash. It's a narrative midrash, meaning we're not learning anything practical here about how to observe Judaism, <laughs> but we're learning something about what's behind the scenes in the Torah. The Torah tells us that the Egyptians drowned. The midrash picks up and says, yes, but God wasn't happy. Right? God was sad, and the people ought to have been sad and not just joyful that the Egyptians had drowned. That's a narrative midrash. There is also halakhic midrash. Halakhic midrash are midrashim that are based on not the narrative sections of the Torah, not the stories, but on the laws. Right? What is, the, what is a, an example of that? One of the famous ones I can think of is the the, the portion that deals with the rebellious son. The rebellious son in the Torah, remember what, what has to happen to the rebellious son? The son is a drunk and he's not listening to his parents. The Torah says, Lo shomea bekol aviv bekol imo. He doesn't listen to his mother and he doesn't listen to his father. What do we do with him? No. <laughs> yeah, he's, we got to be stoned. Right, so... So the, the Talmud has a whole section, a whole sugiya that deals with the rebellious son. And it interprets, what is this rebellious son? What did he actually do? And since the Torah says, Lo shomea bekol aviv bekol imo, he didn't listen to his mother and his father. The Talmud says, and this is based on Midrash, the, in order for him to be proven guilty, the father and the mother must have told him at the same time, with the same, in the same manner, don't do X. And then he went and, and did. Well, what are the chances of that happening? Almost zero. Right? Lo shomea bekol avi bekol imo. This is a midrash. It's based on a close reading of the Bible. The rabbis basically wanted, I mean, actually, we don't know what they wanted to do, but some would say their intention was to get rid of the category altogether because it is cruel to punish somebody, a child, for being rebellious. You'll end up punishing every Jewish child that ever lived. So, so they interpreted so narrowly that they almost render the category to be completely irrelevant. Right? Look, he has to, it has to be the mother and the father because that's what the Torah says. So that's an example of a halachic midrash. That's not based on a story, that's based on a practical law. So that if you come to a Beitin or to a rabbi and say, stone my son, he didn't listen to me, the rabbis would say, we're not doing it because you and, the, and your wife were not on the same page when it came to bringing him up, and that's required in Jewish law. Are these midrashim all written down in a separate source? No, they're, they're all over the place. They are midrashim. all over the place. There are books that are, you know, collections of midrashim. There's midrash Rabbah. There's, I'll, I'll come to my office, so I'll show you. I'll, I'll show you a bunch of books. But many of them are in the Talmud, right? They're all over the place. The important thing with the midrash is that it is a rabbinic interpretation grounded in the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, which we call it the Torah. It's grounded in the Torah. But we learn from the Torah either something narrative that's interesting or something practical, something halakhic that's interesting. There were two main schools of Midrashim in ancient, in, in the earliest of rabbinic circles. They were called the school of Rabbi Akiva, and the school of Rabbi Ishmael. This, these two academies 
had different ways of doing Midrash. The more famous school is Rabbi Yishmael's school. Every morning in synagogue, in any synagogue, as part of the service, we read this. It's right at the beginning of every Siddur. Rabbi Yishmael Omer Bishloshes Remidot HaTorah Midrashem. Rabbi Ishmael says that the Torah may be expounded by these 13 rules of textual, and textual interpretation, and it then lists the 13. Right? When you come to shul, if you're there on time, you'll, you'll see because the, every shul, Rabbi Ishmael, it's all here. These are the 13 fancy English hermeneutical principles of Rabbi Ishmael. Hermeneutical just means midrashic, the way that he interpreted the Bible. He, Rabbi Ishmael's school used certain rules to prove the rabbinic interpretations that he was coming up with. Very strict 13 principles. One of them, for instance, is a Kal Vachomer. The first one is called Kal Vachomer. An inference may be drawn from one premise to another that is more inclusive or to another that is more exclusive. Kal Vachomer, I'm just giving you an example. I don't want to make this too complicated. But if your mother says that you should wear galoshes when it's uh, when there's a little bit of rain, obviously she wants you to wear galoshes when there's a lot of rain. That's Kal Vachomer. But that's a, hermit, a, a legal hermeneutical principle. Do you see how that could be applied to something in the Torah? If you learn something in a case that's more exclusive, then obviously it applies to a case that is, uh, that, that is more than the original exclusive case. Make sense? Okay. He was very strict. The other school, Rabbi Akiva's school, had no 13 principles. They did whatever they wanted. Their way of doing Midrash was far more expansive and creative. Think of Rabbi Ishmael as needing to paint on a canvas. There were boundaries. He couldn't just come up with stuff out of thin air. Rabbi Akiva's school was very different. The stories and ideas and principles that he came up with, he pulled out of wherever he wanted. He had no boundaries, right? And that is why usually when there is a dispute on a halakhic item, we'll go with the school of Rabbi Ishmael. Because Rabbi Akiva just, we don't know where he gets some of his ideas. So Rabbi Ishmael's rules uh, become more important. That is the background to understanding this story, which is not about Rabbi Ishmael, but about Rabbi Akiva. Okay. If you've seen this story before, maybe some of you have, this is about Rabbi Akiva's interpretation of the crowns on the Torah. Now, if you see a, a Torah scroll, you will see that some letters of the Torah scroll have little crowns above them. Right? And when it says Rabbi Akiva interpreted the crowns on the Torah scroll, it's saying Rabbi Akiva just pulled stuff out of nowhere. The crowns on the Torah are just decorative. They don't really have, you know, they are, they do have some sort of origin, but they really are not meant to be interpreted. But Rabbi Akiva would do it, because Rabbi Akiva could do whatever he wanted. For him, it was about it was about the point that he was trying to make, the story that he was trying to tell, and he grounded that story in whatever he wanted, including the crowns on a letter of the Torah, or a word that he thought was superfluous. Whatever he saw that he didn't like, he would ground this this principle, whatever he would say, on that, on that abnormality. Okay? A story every Jew should know. Let's read it. 
Rabbi Yehuda said that Rav said. A story is told. At the time that Moses went up on high, he found God sitting and affixing crowns to the letters of the Torah. What, Moses is going up high where? He's going up on Mount Sinai. And this text says, the Torah that we have, the Torah that we have, uh, is the same exact Torah that Moses received on Mount Sinai. Even the crowns have their origin in the Sinaitic revelation. Moses said before God, Master of the universe, who forces your hand to put crowns on the letters? God said to Moses, there is a certain man who is destined to live at the end of many generations from now. And his name is Akiva, the son of Yosef. He is destined to expound mounds and mounds of laws upon each Thor. What is God's answer to Moses? You may not, be very careful what it's saying, this is very important, you may not understand why I'm putting these crowns in the law. But one day, a very wise man named Akiva ben Yosef will understand it. It's almost like God is saying, you're going to be superseded by somebody. Someone in, in hundreds of years from now is going to be a revelator, just like you are. Interesting. Like you would think God would say, let me explain to you. I'll, this, is, this crown means this, and that crown means that. But instead, God says, you're not going to know. It's, it's a crazy, crazy midrash. Not midrash, sorry. It's a crazy text. I'm not telling you, God says to Moses. Uh, but one day, somebody, maybe smarter than you, better than you, will know, will figure it out, why these crowns are there. Moses is in disbelief. Master of the universe, show him to me. God said to Moses, turn around. Who's, who's never seen this text before? Okay, and who has? Who has? Just one, okay. Come on, everyone, it's a really important text. Okay, Moses went and sat in the back of Rabbi Akiva's classroom. At the end of eight rows, and he didn't know what they were talking about. Hmm. He became dispirited. But when they came to a certain subject, Rabbi Akiva's disciples said to Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi, how do you know this law? Rabbi Akiva said to his students, It is a law, halacha, given to Moses from Mount Sinai. Moses' spirit was settled. As in, oh, they mentioned my name. <laughs> I'm going to ask you what that means. I want to talk about that. So what does it mean that Moses was upset? And what does it mean that his spirit was settled? When Rabbi Akiva says, we well, learn this from Moses. Halakha le Moshe Sinai. Moses returned and went before God and said before him, Master of the universe, you have a man as great as this one, and yet you give the Torah through me. This is really interesting. So if before you didn't believe me when I asserted, is God saying to Moses, you're not good enough to understand why these crowns are here, but later on somebody better than you is going to figure it out? Uh, it seems pretty clear now, doesn't it? Even Moses says, what are you giving this to me for? I don't understand why these crowns are in the Torah. 
But Rabbi Akiva seems to understand everything. God said to Moses, Silence, this is what arose in my thought. Does God give an answer? No. No. I want to think, us to think about that. God does not answer the question. Master of the universe, Moses said to God. Master of the universe, you showed me his Torah. Show me his reward. God said to Moses, turn around. Moses saw that they were weighing Rabbi Akiva's flesh in the meat market. Rabbi Akiva was one of the martyrs. Remember on Yom Kippur we do a martyrology service? He's one of the martyrs who was punished by the Romans for teaching Torah when they had banned it. He was punished and he was killed and this is a graphic depiction of what happened to him. Moses said before God, Master of the universe, this is his Torah and this is his reward? It's a famous, famous line. Zu Torah v'zu schara. For those of you who speak Hebrew. This is his Torah and this is his reward? Amar lo, God said to Moses, the same thing, shtok, quiet, kach ala b'machshava l'fanai, this is what arose in my thought. Let's see the video, let's see the movie, and then we're going to do, then we'll talk about it. What does this text mean? What does it mean to you? What does God's answer mean to you? Maybe the video might, nobody says video anymore. What if film? Right? Yeah. 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 Six days in San Francisco, six stories, 12 artists. <laughs> 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 When Moses ascended to the heavens, he saw the letters of the Torah that he had received from God and given to the Jewish people. Each letter had been perfect and carefully crafted according to God's instructions. But now there was a crown on the letter Tzadzi he worked so hard on. And wasn't the letter Ayin perfect the way it was? Hey God, what's going on here? Why are you attaching these things to our letters? God explained to Moses that these symbols were crowns. In the future, people would be building and expanding the text he received. Can you show me? Many years after your time, God said, there will come a man named Akiva ben Yosef who will be a great teacher to thousands of students. His lessons and insights will crown your words. In times to come, people will learn our laws and build on them. They will interpret them for the times and make sure they will last. Moses was confused. The students were learning a law that he did not recognize. What had become of his teaching? Rabbi, I'm confused about the source of this law. How do we know we're supposed to do it this way? Where does it come from? We learn this from the text of the Torah. It was given to Moses at Mount Sinai and passed down in oral tradition. It's our job to learn and expand it. Everything was rooted in those words given from God, and the law expanded with the crowns. So if there will be such a great teacher, why did you give the Torah to me? But God told him, Be silent, for this is what I have decided. What a great teacher. He must have gotten such a wonderful reward. God 
told him, Be silent, for this is what I have decided. Okay, what's up? You saw the video. We read the text. Uh, one thing I should have said before, the Shema Yisrael part, so the, the origin of a Jew saying those words before uh, they die is Rabbi Akiva. The story that's told of his death is that his last words before he was killed were Shema Yisrael, and he says, now I know what it means to love God all my being. Right, is that I, I've said the Shema and I'm prepared to die for being a Jew. And that's the story that's told at the martyrology service. So this is a very, very important story. And I want to open up now to some of your understandings of this story. I specifically want to ask what is the relationship between the point that is being made about Rabbi Akiva's interpretation of the text and Rabbi Akiva's death? Why, are, why do we care in this story? To know, there's obviously a connection, right? Because God gives the same answer to Moses. Moses says, why are you giving the Torah to me and not to him? God says, this is what I decide. And why are you, show me the reward this man gets. Well, why, why is this the reward given to such a brilliant man? And God said, silence, this is what I decided. So there's a lesson here both about rabbinic authority and innovation, and I would offer, I'm not going to tell you, I hope you'll tell me, I would offer there's a lesson here also about why God, remember this goes back to what we learned last week, when does God lo bashamayu, when is God descending from heaven, when is God not descending from heaven, are there implications here also in, in terms of theology, Theology, not rabbinic law, but when does God intervene? When does God not intervene? Why is a good, why is a bad thing happening to the greatest of rabbis? Okay, so I'm opening it up now. What do we make of this story? What is the point? What is the, What are some lessons that we're learning? Moses got the literal Torah, but the rabbi Akiva got uh, was authorized to expand on it. But Why? Because God gave him that permission. God first gave him that permission. But yeah. I think his his uh, demise was because maybe he overstepped. That. Oh, interesting. So you think this is punishment maybe. for Rabbi Akiva? God doesn't say it's punishment, but you think it could be punishment because he went too far. Yeah, Interesting. Interesting. Right? Okay. Other thoughts? Don't make me do all the work. <laughs> Marlene. I, I think that God has a realization that times change. And the way that we interpret the halakha will change as the times change so that the halakha fits the time, and that's what Rabbi Akiva was doing at, at, at his point in time. But I think this that, that seems to be the interpretation of the film. If you paid close attention to the film, the narrator says, Rabbi Akiva will be expanding upon the crowns since the Torah must be made relevant for the times in which it was given. This is, if it's true, I mean, this is a story, right? But the interpretation of the film, this is a very, very important principle in Judaism, 
that the rabbis are grounding here in the story of a miracle. This is a miracle. This is not told in the Torah, this story, right? This is a time-traveling story, right? Uh, Moses is sent forward in time and sits in the back of Rabbi Akiva's classroom and is totally confused. What does it mean that he's totally confused? Well, if your great-great-grandparents would walk into <coughs> Home Depot or Costco or, or, you know, would they understand any of the appliances <coughs> that they were looking at? I sort of think, think it's the same thing here with Moses visiting Rabbi Akiva's classroom. He, he looks around, cannot understand what Rabbi Akiva is talking about. Because perhaps it's that the times are totally different. What are the rabbis saying? I mean, actually, let me finish. You finish, Marlene, and then I'll ask my question. Yeah. Well, I, I, think, I think what you're seeing here is that Judaism is not stagnant. It doesn't remain the same, and it does have to change. And sometimes the person who speaks out for that change is not going to be accepted, which is why we see Rabbi Akiva uh, having the punishment that he got. Yes. His words were not accepted at the time, but now when we look back, we see merit in what in what he's telling us. And when we when we quote something, I mean, if you look at Pirkei Avot, they always start with, and it came from Moses who gave it to this one and yes. gave it to that one. And here again, we look back to him as an authority, and we can work on his words and interpret them for our time. So does everyone understand this? There's, there's an important point here that's being made about rabbinic authority. Again, think of the person who's telling this story. Who is it? Rabbi Yehuda in the name of Rab. What is Rabbi Yehuda and what are they saying in telling this story? That we have, we are the inheritors of Rabbi Akiva's expansive Midrashic tradition, which allows us to interpret on almost nothing a crown on a letter. And this might seem to you to be crazy. How can we come up with a law when it's based on some abnormality in a text? And we're not sure whether that abnormality means X, Y, or Z. Because it's our job to take the law to apply it to our day. And how we connect that modern application to the source book, right, is, is not all that important. We can do it because God told Moses that one day we would be doing that. It's the process of taking an old tradition and maintaining its relevancy, <clears throat> maintaining its ability to change that we, uh, that, that we insist upon, right? And even when the students in the class say, what are you doing? The answer is, it's not, the answer is, it's not us. It's not me, Rabbi Akiva. It's not me, Rabbi Akiva, who is ordaining this change. It's Moses. What does that mean to you? What does that mean when the students say, how are you doing this? And Rabbi Akiva says, well, this is how Moses, well, Moses is there in the classroom and he doesn't understand so what is happening? Marlene sort of Marlene mentioned it. Is there anyone else who uh, can connect the dots there? The fact that Moses was settled when he yes. mentioned his name. Yeah. It's because 
any expansion has to be based on the literal Torah that Moses received. So yeah, you can expand on it, but the caveat is it has to have roots and basis on the literal Torah that was given out by Messiah. It's almost like and no, that's a limitation. Right. There is right. a limit. Do you have room? But there's a limit. Yes. It's almost like Moses set forward a process, but didn't know where it would lead. And when he finds himself centuries later in the classroom to see where it led, he doesn't he has no clue what they're talking about and is upset. But then what is he what is what makes what settles him when Rabbi Akiva says what we are learning here I am not pulling out of thin air. It is rooted back to the original process which was set in motion by Moses at Sinai. Did it actually, was it actually said at Moses at Sinai? Think of the story I told you about the rebellious son. Did God actually say the mother and the father have to speak in the same manner at the same time? No. If God wanted to say that, it could have been a lot clearer. <clears throat> so when Moses hears that happening, and when he hears that explained in Rabbi Akiva's classroom, he says, I don't know what they're talking about. But, but Rabbi, Akiva's, Rabbi Akiva's declaration is, Moses in the Torah, very, very similar to the last story, gives us, gives rabbis the authority to interpret the Torah as we see fit. And I think here, the assertion of the film is that it has to fit the time that we are in. Um, that, that point was not made that clearly in the last story. In the last story, it just seemed to be about a bunch of nerds fighting over who's right and who's wrong based on logical arguments about the kashrut of an oven. Here there's a clearer understanding of the expansion of the Torah as time goes on. And just like in the last story, where the, the, the comforting assertion that's made in the Talmud is God, God saying, Nitzhuni banai, Nitzhuni banai, my children have defeated me, my children have defeated me. Here, it's Moses. It's not God saying, my children have defeated me. It's Moses saying, he's placated. In the first story, we get God to affirm the right of rabbis to interpret the Torah as they see fit. It's a more dramatic, right? Much more important vote of support from Hashem. But we also need Moshe Rabbeinu to say, you can do this. And in this story, it's Moses who is placated. He is the one who says, Nitzvuri Banai, Nitzvuri, I've been. I am placated, I'm happy. Why? In the first story, it was because the Torah says, Lo me, and God promised to stay out of it. Okay, in this story, what is it that placates Moses? It's that whatever interpretations Rabbi Akiva is coming up with, he gives credit to the original teacher. Or what I would say, he places himself on the link of Lador Bador of Jewish tradition. By saying, this is how we learned by our teacher Moses, he's hooking himself, Rabbi Akiva, back perhaps maybe, maybe many links 
to the revelation at Sinai, but he's on the chain. Now you might say, but this is crazy. Rabbi Akiva is given more authority than Moses. Right? Moses had to follow the text that he was given. Rabbi Akiva could just come up with whatever he wants and, and hook it on the, on the chain of Jewish history. Right? So my question would be, why does Rabbi Akiva have that authority? What is this text saying about where Rabbi Akiva's authority comes from? It's not explicit, but you should be able to understand it just from a general reading. Why can Rabbi Akiva do that? Do you have an answer, Robert? Well, it may not be a direct answer, but yeah. it, it ties into what's going through my mind. So, first of all, I'm going to read it to you. I do recall on one of our occasions, during the middle part of the text, I think this is the first time we are studying the whole thing. The whole, or, or the thought yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on the text, so it, it, it helps to put it in more context. What I having difficulty with is when it says after Rabbi Akiva says that the law given, given to, uh, to Moses and Holy Spirit was settled. Yep. What's not clear is, and I think this is key to to how this uh, we can understand this in a, in, a, in a broader context is was Moses, was Moses satisfied because um uh, Simply by uh, by Rabbi Akiva citing, uh, like declaring essentially yeah. that, that this is uh, according to uh, the law that was given to, to, to Moshe, or was was Moshe uh, convinced that uh, he was confused about what was being discussed originally? Was he then convinced that there was an actual connection? Like. So I guess oh, I think not, it's the I think it's the former, right? We don't have clear answers yet, but I, I think it's the former. I think it's that Moses Moses is placated when he realizes that whatever Rabbi Akiva is explaining is a uh, modern in modern application of a law that originated with Moses. But, but, is, but is that how halakha actually developed? That's a bigger question. Because, because like this is suggesting that as long as a rabbi um, declares but, that, 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 that it's so. Okay, so that you're correct. But that's what's leading me to my question. That is very crazy and frightening. How can it be? I could stand up here and say, walk on your feet, because the Torah well, says so. Not walk on your feet. Walk on your hands, because the Torah says so. <laughs> right? So where does Rabbi Akiva get his authority from? Why can he do it? So it says that he's destined. So it's somehow yeah. it's part of a bigger plan, that he's the one that is going to expound, and it says mounds and mounds. So it means yeah. that he's going to have lots to say about it. It's him. ordained by God, but there's more there. You're right. I would go a little bit further, because there were many others who, there was Rabbi Ishmael too, right? So why does, why is Rabbi Akiva mentioned here? I think it's because, in the text, Rabbi Akiva is praised for being like Moses in his even more than Moses in his intellect. I think Moses saying, this guy's so smart. Why are you giving the Torah to me? This guy's brilliant. Is a way of the rabbis claiming that the Torah's application, it functions not just by a rabbi saying, I believe this is how the law should be interpreted today. But those that have the greatest intellect, uh, the one who is the smartest, that rabbi's ability to get students to follow him, to prove to others that he's correct, this is the 
crown of a meritocracy, right? That the text here claims on rabbinic culture. That is also very different than the story we learned last night. If you agree with me. If you don't agree with me, then, then fine. Last week's story was de about democracy. You had one rabbi who presumably Rabbi Eliezer was smarter than everybody else because God said he's correct. But the majority says he's wrong. So in the story last week, majority, the, the, the underlying, I guess, ideal here in that story is when the majority says you're wrong, you, you are not to destabilize the community by making laws in your own way, you go along with the with the request of the majority or with the with the um, answer of the majority. Here, there is no majority and minority. There's just one rabbi who is praised in this text by Moses to be smarter than him, more deserving of receiving the Torah than him, and who gets the right to basically interpret the Torah as he sees fit, because he's smarter than everybody else. So he's smarter, but at the beginning you said that he's also very creative. In yeah. His, so, but we don't follow his creativity. We use Ishmael's interpretations every morning. Yeah. Why don't we use Akiva? Well, Akiva doesn't have any principles, right? He does what he wants. That's the that's the the whole joke here is he would he would interpret what does he say? He is mounds and mounds of laws from a thorn, right? The crown on the Torah is actually three but thorns. So every thorn he would interpret mounds and mounds of laws. That's how great he was with the interpretations that he would come up with. His greatness, don't just judge by his ability to be creative, but his ability to um, apply ancient principles to modern needs, contemporary needs. That's his brilliance. So it's the creativity with the intellect. It's, it's, the, it's the combination. Like not I would say in this story, it's about survival. Do you know why I'm saying that? Right? I, I'm, I'm going along with the video's interpretation of the text. I think it's correct. This is a story about Akiva's responsibility, the Jewish community's responsibility, to ensure that the Torah does not um, fossilize into history. If it is not updated, if it does not, if there is no innovation to fit the times you are in, right. it will become irrelevant. Rabbi Akiva is praised for being particularly revelatory. He's like Moses in the same way that the Torah is a, a revolution in the way we think of religious living, community living. So does Rabbi Akiva need to uh, re-reveal a new Torah for, uh, for his generation. And that's his brilliance. It's the end product. Yes, he hooks it onto crowns in the Torah, right? But, but his ability to change the Torah, innovate the Torah, to convince people that this is how God always intended it to be, that's what made him so brilliant. So this, just one more thing. So historically, he comes at the at the end of the Roman period when when the Jews are about to be expelled. Is that is that his, historically when he lived? Yes. If you remember, Rabbi Akiva was the one who backed uh, the Bar Kokhba mm -hmm. uh, right. so messianic revolt, where they thought, Mark, and it was it was in, he was incorrect. 
right? Bar Kokhba was not the Messiah, and Bar Kokhba, and, and this led to a major, major war and the loss of Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel. Right. So, so this the, the, he lived during very, very tumultuous times in Jewish history, especially a time after the destruction of the temple, where Judaism had to be reimagined. And the rabbis tell this story, I think, in order to say it is our responsibility, not just our responsibility, but our authority, our right to interpret the Torah in the way that we see fit. We don't even need to ground it that closely in uh, textual traditions. We just have to be really smart. And whoever is the smartest among us will have the authority to interpret. And Moses himself would want it that way. But we still haven't gotten to God's I'm not going to end this class until you help me with, I think, a very powerful part of the story, which is God telling Moses to shut up. <laughs> shut means shut up. Yeah. And, and so, Rabbi, are you next week going to deal with uh, God's response? And In this text? Yeah. No, no, I'm not ending this class now. I want to deal with it now. Following up on what Roz said. I won't end the class until... So following up on what yeah. Roz said. Context, uh, but if you look holistically, it, it didn't end well. Not only was uh, Rabbi Akiva martyrized, yep. his followers, they were, uh, he didn't say, they had to leave the earth for Allah. I think the text was used in Holocaust times too. Why did, why did God remain silent? Right. So, so that is the challenge for us. If you holistically, you, you, I wouldn't say Rabbi Akiva. But so successful if you if you looked at B'nai Israel and thought, well, that was not a good outcome. Not a good outcome. And Moses would agree with you. Moses says, Zu Torah Bezus You just told me this guy was that smarter than me, better than me. And he's gonna be executed. And God has <coughs> nothing to answer. So explain to me, help me understand. Put yourself in the mind of the author of this story. What is the author struggling with? And what is the response of the author? How does it fit in this story? What is God's role here? I, I can almost make the analogy to the you know, we talked about democracy, and if the rabbis are the legislature, God yeah. is the Supreme Court, literally supreme. Yes. And, and, and if you make a law, or, or you overexpand on my Torah. This is going with your interpretation yeah. that this is punishment, that Rabbi Akiva is, is punished for over... Okay, interesting. If God is the Supreme Court, then perhaps God is saying, you've gone too far, and Rabbi Akiva is punished by a painful death. And his, his answer, be quiet, is, how do you understand when God says to Moses, be quiet? It's so, so don't question my judgment. Yeah. Uh, right. This is what's just? Okay, interesting. I don't see it that way, but... But that is, there's no right or wrong way to look at the text. I see it like almost the total opposite. Yeah. <laughs> I think there is a connection there between Akiva and Moses in their relationship to God. Yeah. Akiva knows a lot and is obviously very smart. Yes, bad, yeah. But he believes, his belief in God is unshakable. He is willing to die through being burned. Yes. Moses believed in God was also unshakable at the end. So that's why we can accept the decree, the unquestioned decree of Akiva and Moses. We accept it because we're accepting yes. God's oh, decree. Yeah. Because? 
because they believed in God, so it's like coming down from God anyway. The, 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 the laws and the... Ah, so you're saying just like God decrees laws, the story is saying God decrees deaths and punishment no. No. and it's interesting. It's that God decrees the punishment. That the belief that God is the ultimate. Right? Yes. The ultimate. So But I, I want to challenge that interpretation because when Moses sees uh, that Rabbi Akiva says, this is what we learned at Moses, uh, Rabbi Akiva, uh, Moses is placated, says it in the text. What is Moses' reaction when God says, shut up, this is how I decreed it? Does it say Moses was placated? It says nothing. Twice God has the final word, and I don't think most. I think Moses' silence is a very telling silence. If the text wanted to say Moses was placated by God's silence, it would have said so. It just did two verses before when Akiva made that claim. God, Moses here, I don't believe is placated. <coughs> Any other ideas before you? Yeah, Robert and Marlene. I actually, God's I silence. What does God's silence mean? What is the lesson here? God's silence or Moshe's silence? Uh, sorry. Well, it's it's God silencing Moses. But so, I guess I gave away a little bit of the answer. Uh, it's both, isn't it? It's God not answering Moses' question, right? And also stopping Moses from asking questions. I thought what you, what you just said was leading to what I was just thinking. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly, so let me just express what I'm thinking, although I'm not sure that they want to really ask the question. But there seems to be a parallel between the communication between Moshe and God when, when God tells him, uh, Moshe, he's not going to go into, into the, uh, into where it's Israel. Yes. And yeah. he's going to die. Right. Um, and although, and Moses. But Moses was punished. Are, so are you, do you agree that this is punishment for Rabbi Akiva? I wasn't thinking of it that way. I wasn't oh. thinking about the punishment after, but that raises a pretty question, I guess. And, and maybe just the, the parallel is that just as God decided that Moshe was, uh, his time had come, that when God decided that Rabbi Akiva's time had come, uh, I mean, it, 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 isn't, it isn't really clear, but, it, but I guess the only thing is just as we debate to this day was it just that, that Moshe was not allowed to enter Eretz Israel. We can debate whether it was it was just that Rabbi Akiva suffered a kind, a kind of death. I mean, we're all going to die eventually. It's just the issue is whether he what what justified the cruel death that that he went. And we have no answer. Mm. To, it seems that we have no answer to either. One. Maybe that's. But there is no answer. There is no answer. Very God, good. God makes decisions that we can't God makes decisions that we don't the understand. Of, of, of right? And here, perhaps, it's an assertion of the Talmud that when it says, God said, be quiet, it's because the Talmud has nothing to say on the question of why bad things happen to good people. Akiva was not punished. We don't know. No, he, he could have been his faith yeah. and live. Yeah. So his French belief in God a hug, the word a hug, yes. stretched out. Yeah. Meaning that that belief in God guides I, I agree that I don't think that this story is saying that Rabbi Akiva is punished. 
but I still think we've got to work on what is the story saying. Yeah. Yes. And it reminds me of the Holocaust, basically, that, you know, where was God a lot of people at? So what's the answer? It, it's that people were chosen to be evil. And that's just going around the end, even at the end. And God wasn't part of it. He sat and wept, probably, to see this. Well, well, God sat and wept, but more so... What does God say to Moses at the object, objection about God give, having this fate for Rabbi Akiva? It's more than that. It's that God, it, it's not that God sat and wept. But he can't get But God involved. won't exactly. God isn't intervening. It goes back to the story we read last week. Yes, it does. How so? Where it said, Lo Bashamayim. Right. God, this God is what I this. love about these stories, and I really need you all to feel this. These are stories about rabbinic innovation. And one, on one hand, it's about rabbis and the authority they have to determine the law and the Torah as they see fit. I think we all get that, right? I hope. Otherwise, I've done a lousy job. But I, I hope you get that. But in both stories, you are hearing the struggle of the rabbis at the same time with pushing God and Moses out of the picture. In the first story that we learned, the rabbis claim, we can do as we see fit. God, mind your own business. But then there's this story at the end about Rabbi Ishmael, who is an outcast, and all these terrible things happening because he looks at the, at the world, and the world starts to burn, and God, is, God is, wants to get involved and teach the people, don't you do this to somebody who just has a different opinion about a stupid oven, why are you doing this to him? It's, think of it from the point of view of the author. The author is struggling with, we can push God out of the legal process, but what do we do with the God that we need to be with us in our pain? What do we do with the God that we need to answer our prayers? What do we do with the God that we rely upon? We can push him out of the Torah, but how can we push him out of our lives. And in this story, you don't get an answer, I think, but you definitely get the same struggle. You're getting the rabbis saying, yeah, we don't need Moses anymore. All we're going to do is say that whatever law we came up with originates with Moses on Mount Sinai. God gave us the authority to determine the laws as we see fit, if I want to make an interpretation based on a crown, on a letter, I can do it. Moses, mind your own business. God, mind your own business. But the story quickly morphs into, but then something bad happens. And God, Moses, as sort of the representative of the Jewish people, feels like, why is this happening to him? I thought that I thought that good things are supposed to happen. I thought that God was in control. And it's almost like as the rabbis are pushing God away from the legal parts of the Torah, they are making their peace with a new relationship with God where God does not get involved in the affairs of man. I was watching that movie and reading this story and could not help but feel like we are in a similar moment. Right? How can all these... We should really be able to understand Moses' plea. These are innocent people. How zutorah zuschara. These pious, loyal, 
Jews, good people, are punished in this way? And 2,000 years ago, the rabbis imagined God's voice saying, Shtok, be, be silent. This is the way I have made it. This is the way the world is. As I pull myself away from the Judaism that you might want to have, the Judaism you might want to have is the Judaism where if you want to know the law, the tree will walk around and tell you what the law is, or a voice will come from heaven. That's the Judaism you want. You want the Judaism where when, when something bad happens to something good, God descends and makes the bad thing go away. But it's another story of Judaism intellectually, theologically, reaches a different phase in development. Now, the power is with the community, both to interpret the law as it see fits, but also to accept that God will not intervene when man is cruel against man. But that is the way God ordained it to be. For whatever, for, you can see, for whatever reason, I'm not going to get into the whole theology, but, you know, as you're right, as it is said in the Holocaust, God can't intervene every single time. But a grown-up has to learn lessons through making mistakes. And Akiva had to go through what he had to go through. We don't know why, but we know that the people who died uh, three weeks ago had to go through whatever. God ordained it that way. The world was not set up where God would intervene. <coughs> and I think that's what makes this text so gorgeous, is that it, it, it weaves rabbinic authority with the implications on theology. Are you with me on that? They're a little bit fancy words, but it, the rabbis could easily have made a case saying, we are, we are in charge, and stay out of it, Moses, stay out of it, God. But they go a step further and wrestle with the most profound question there is in religion, which is why do bad things happen with go pe with, to good people? And they're not afraid to encounter it because they understand that as they push God away, which is really about contending with a God that let the temple be destroyed, that let Rabbi Akiva get murdered, that let all these bad things happen to good people, that they have to face the repercussions and, and accept God's silence sometimes. Yes? So why, why did God ask So that answer, that question was answered last week. Right? Last week, remember Rabbi Ishmael, Rabbi Ishmael's wife. Was it his wife? Yes. Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Eliezer's wife uh, says, asks that question. If I have the story correct. Uh, if, you, if, if you remember, the answer the Talmud give, gives is God hears the prayers of the suffering. Right? So, why do we pray? Because God sometimes says nothing, but sometimes does intervene, and we don't know exactly how that works, but definitely sometimes God does step in. Right, that's the story of Rabbi Eliezer who kills his brother-in-law. Remember, he, he prays, and his wife tried to stop him, but she couldn't, and then his brother-in-law dies, and then and then the Thomas says, what, what do you mean? I, I thought God, it says, well, Shemayim, God's not going to get involved. But then, she, but then the, the text ends, God does get involved when it is the prayer of the brokenhearted. Here, there is no, there is no, reassurance. All we get is silence. I think all together you're hearing the big picture of struggle. We are, we are accepting God's limited 
interaction with humanity, but at the same time struggling with that very question. Well, then who do we pray to? Who can we rely on when bad, when we want to stop a bad thing from happening to a good person? And there's no answer. Yes, last, last comment. Yeah, but when we pray, just knowing that sometimes God will intervene and sometimes he won't, um, it, it, it actually makes our prayer more fervent because we're really trying to get his attention. And, and the answer may be silent and may be no, but it could be yes. And we, we pray on the hope that it could be yes sometimes. I agree. But I don't think you have to, right? This is it. As I said, this is the biggest question in religion, right? Why pray when God's, when God's answer is stop? Then why pray? Sometimes you're going to get a no, but sometimes you're going to get a The rabbis are struggling with that. The first question is much easier to understand. Stay out of it, stay out of it Moses. It's our job. The second is hard. Okay, thank you, everyone. More next week. Cool.